so um, how's everyone doing? All right, cool. So uh, we're going to talk about functional JavaScript today. Um, but before we dive into uh, monads and uh, get into some complicated stuff, I want to talk about uh, just do like a little intro about learning to program as a working programmer, which is, uh, I, I don't know, I feel like it's something that we don't talk about enough because it's like, I've, it is like simultaneously the most exciting and stressful and anxiety inducing thing in the world to be a working programmer who's been doing it for a long time and then to have to try to learn an entirely new way of programming, uh, to be a beginner again. And so it's a lot different. Like if, if you've never written a line of programming before and you start to look at like, you know, you know, doing things in a functional way, uh, I will say that it's probably easier for you because you just, you don't know any other way and you can just kind of like, you, you kind of like build and go from there. Uh, does this program look familiar to anybody? Uh, not the specific syntax, but uh, I've probably written this a hundred times and like every intro to object-oriented programming class has some sort of variation on this um, where, you, you know, they try, we're trying to demonstrate inheritance here. So we have a base animal class with some properties and some methods and and then we do, do something like exhilarating and amazing, like create a dog class that can override some of these methods. And if you were able to stay in your seat with all the excitement on that, you, you know, you can extend it even further and you can create a person class that does things like we can tell it to walk, it complains and says, do I really have to? Um, and so like this is how we learned how to program, right? And, but when you think about it now, like does that get you fired up as a programmer, like using object-oriented techniques? Like, do you get, like who wants to leave this talk right now and go like write code because you're just like motivated by that? <laughs> it, it doesn't happen at all, right? But at the time we didn't think that. It's because we didn't, we didn't really know anything, right? And so um, the reason why we went on to build these amazing complex systems in ob with object orientation and the whole reason why you're here today as a working programmer is because we put in the work. We, you would, look, would go home and you didn't know anybody, you're like, this is how I build programs, and so we thrashed and we built things. We built real things and we shipped some stuff, and that is the whole reason why it became valuable and why hopefully we get paid to do the work that we do every day. Um, but hidden under those, like, a, that tiny original example were some big ideas, like inheritance and polymorphism that the instructor was trying to get across. It's just now, it's just, it looks silly to look back at it. Uh, so these are big ideas, but, we, but such small examples, right? Um, and I think the same is true when we try to learn a new paradigm. And this is a common thing that they'll show you when you learn a functional approach. Um, and as a working programmer, so if you're at the beginning, you're like, oh, Kari, this is kind of a cool thing. But as a working programmer now, you're like, cool, this literally helps me do nothing as part of my job. Uh, and so we don't get excited, right? We have a higher bar now. And it's a lot harder to get us to change our minds about, about writing things. And it, it's funny if you ever ask somebody, oh, have you used X framework or library? Uh, how many people have heard the answer, oh, I've played with it, or like I've toyed with it. That's like the new, you put it on the resume when you've played with it, which is like a weird thing because it just pretty much means you typed out the example, but never used it in a real, in a real life setting. And so, um, and that's because we, we did it, but we didn't really see how to apply it in the real world. Uh, and there are some amazing functional JavaScript uh, tutorials and books, like Functional JavaScript by O'Reilly is an amazing one. But I, and I think you have to start there, but I think there isn't enough uh, from going in the reverse angle. So what I want to do is kind of like reverse engineer the hype to talk about building a, a whole system in, in JavaScript uh, instead of starting from the ground up. And so hopefully it's uh, just a little bit of a different take. But adopting big ideas is hard, right? This is the reason why we toyed with that functional language or framework and didn't actually start doing it is because, um, how many people do you, have seen this book before? Uh, yeah, I figured we would have something like that, but um, this is Douglas Crockford, and so he actually gave a talk a year or so ago and he uh, called The Better Parts, which was uh, pretty interesting. And he talks about this idea of adopting big ideas, uh, big new ideas. Uh, and he says it's way back when, it took a generation for us as the programming community at large to agree that high level languages were a good idea. Which is funny to us now because like, you could just picture like some assembler, some assembly programmer just be like, why, C, like really? Do we really need to have like that level of, uh, of sort of sophistication in our abstractions, it just seems like a waste. Like, why would I waste my time to learn a whole new language for that? Um, now, that's obviously, it's, we consider that silly, right? And then it took, another, it took another generation to agree that objects were a good idea. So what we consider to be, uh, you know, how we build apps today was once thought about as just unnecessary, right? Like, we had, uh, we had programs with functions and we could do all these different things. And so like, why would we go through the trouble of like creating a dog that inherits a base animal? Like I just don't see the point. 
Uh, but now we sort of take it for granted, right? Because we are the generation that adopted that. Uh, and then he says it took two full generations to agree that lambdas were a good idea. Um, and, and so, but now lambdas are in every language. They're in like, you know, Java, in, in .NET. Um, these core object-oriented languages are now, everything has lambdas, right? And so he, he makes the argument that lambdas took two generations uh, because they are the best idea in the history of programming. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I didn't really follow that logic. Maybe we just wanted to get it right, so it took twice as long, I'm not really sure. But what, what I really took away from this was his next quote, where he says, in order for us to wait for the next big thing to catch on, we need to wait for the previous generation to retire or die before we can get critical mass on the next big idea. <laughs> I'm, I, this is a quote, I made sure I got every word right. Because when he said this, the audience started clapping and laughing, and they went crazy. And I was just like, well, this is getting dark. <laughs> like, then, I, how did this happen so quickly? Uh, and so I, I understand the sentiment. Like I know what he was going for there. And it's the same thing. It's like you get home from your job, you don't want to learn a new thing. Or, or you're interested in it, but it's just it's a lot of work. And so we'll wait for the next people to do it. And I'll just hang on to my, my languages and doing things the way, the way I do it. But I, I'm going to take a different approach. I'm going to be a little more positive. And like we're here, a lot of us are here on a, a day off. Or like we quit at work. We're taking our time to further ourselves professionally. We are not the programming community at large. Uh, this is a group of people who is here today interested in making themselves better. And so I think that uh, for us to adopt big ideas, the real thing we need to do is we need to make real apps with it. Uh, because we need to see it all the way through instead of that little utility function. We need to see the end result. And so that's, this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so here's, here's the agenda. Um, I'm going to briefly cover why now and why JavaScript, just because you're going to have, you, you're going to get confronted with this all the time. So let's just to squash it. Uh, then we'll talk about functional patterns for real apps. This, I hope, to be the meat of, of this talk today. And then lastly, we'll talk about revisiting the mental model because we're sold on object orientation as being the only way of doing things because it models the real world because of that mental model where we can make the relation of it is this thing in my program that models a thing in real life and so I know how to program it. And we'll just talk about how or if that changes. Um, and we have to start, unfortunately, with this public, public service announcement um, that this is a talk uh, by a practitioner for, pro for practitioners. We're not going to talk about math or like any sort of like crazy high-level concepts because that's been covered, uh, A, because it's been covered enough by everyone else, um, and B, because I, I don't, it would be disingenuous for me to do anything else. I'm building real apps, and I want to build apps in this way, and so that is what I'm going to talk about. And it's unfortunate that we even have to have that as a PSA, a public service announcement, because for reasons like this, right? Uncle Bob Martin, who's like, this guy's no slouch, <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. He says, the arrogance of some functional programmers is a significant barrier to entry, right? So, God forbid you post a question about functional JavaScript in a forum and you just get torn apart by some of these functional guys. Um, and it's not just him, this is the, the creator of Lodash. He says, you know, unfortunately, this mirrors my experience too. Again, this guy knows what he's talking about. He is not, you know, some beginner person. And if these guys feel that way, uh, when you first start going down this path, I need you to beware of, of these people. Uh, because this is forever. Like, <laughs> this is just every programming forum ev ever. And um, there's a million memes like this, but I really like this one. I'm not even a soccer fan, but like particularly, look at this. Like, look at this guy's face. He's just happy, and these guys are just like, look at this, he's trying to write functional JavaScript. It's not even a real language. <laughs> it's a toy language. Like, why is he wasting his time? Um, but every time someone does that to you, I want you to feel like this guy, right? Because this guy just shipped something. He just shipped a feature. Something is real in production. He's just going to go have fun now while these guys are just going to hang back and whine and complain. So realize that when, when haters hate on you in the forums or, or whenever you feel like, oh, I'm not smart enough to do functional programming because these guys say monad over and over again, it uh, has nothing to do with being smart enough. It's just this is, this is the, uh, the world that we, we live in sometimes. So. Uh, so then why bother, right, if it's like, this, I just made it sound like this incredibly harsh landscape. So why do we want to do functional anyway? Um, Dave Thomas is a guy that I've, I've sort of like looked up to in my career. He's the, he wrote The Pragmatic Programmer. And so he says, uh, there's no longer any debate. The future has to be functional. Immutable data and it has to be concurrent. It's the only way to grow. And then Uncle Bob Martin again. It's almost certainly true that functional programming is the next big thing. I like this one just because Uncle Bob Martin authored the solid principles. Like, to me, he is the object-oriented guy. And so how many people here feel confident and certain that the JavaScript libraries they're using today is going to be what they're using next month? 
Like, we don't have certainty. Like, in front of developers, we don't have certainty, but there's a whole lot of certainty in these two sentences. The future has to be functional. It's almost certainly true. And so why, how, how can they have so much confidence in this? Um, does anyone know what this is? I would be surprised. I didn't. It's Moore's Law, right. Um, that's pretty good that you guys could spot that. And so this is just, it's the transistor count going up over time and talking about how it doubles every two years. And I looked at this, and I'm like, this is a pretty good slope. If this was my bank account, I'd be pretty happy. Uh, but the, it, even the more interesting thing is if you like dive into the data here, right? So it's like we started off in the 70s and 80s going from 2,000 to 10,000, which is like a huge jump. And then we go to 100,000, a million. And then all of a sudden we're at 2.6 billion, right? So this is impressive, but then you realize this is not even a linear graph. This is, is meant so we can like read the lettering and stuff. If we actually plot it linearly, this is what it looks like. This is the same time span in the same actual data plotted linearly. Uh, has much more of an impact for me. But JavaScript is single-threaded. Like, why, why do we care about transistors or anything like that? And so, just to be clear, the argument there is that in order for us to grow going forward and to get uh, to reap the benefits of Moore's Law, we're going to have to uh, program it in a parallel and concurrent way. That is the, that is the argument. That we're just, otherwise, we won't be able to uh, take advantage of, uh, of all that new power. But the reason why JavaScript is, is capability meets opportunity, right? It's like I'm such a sucker for sports analogies. I feel like this is such a sports thing. But the opportunity is that. It is that the future has to be functional for, for every other language, right? And so then you have this little tiny engine that could in JavaScript that's like it did one thing extremely right. Uh, and it's the best thing about JavaScript is its implementation of functions. It just got everything right in this regard. So it's the capability of a language that just happened to nail every, the, the, it does a lot of things wrong, don't get me wrong, but the things that it got right all lend itself towards this functional way of programming. And then there's also this other side benefit that I'm not going to spend much time on, but familiarity is a big thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't be writing classes in ES6. The only reason why these exist is for familiarity for Java programmers and C-sharp programmers. But what happens when the future is functional? Uh, familiarity is not going to look like this as much anymore. And so having familiarity in JavaScript, this is a much lesser argument. I'm not going to, this is not a building uh, block of my argument here, but um, it's just something to observe. Uh, but I promised that we'd talk about real apps. So enough of uh, the intro. I want to talk about, I created a demo app, um, and it's, I swear it's, it's the example app that I recreate every year. Um, but it, I, I rewrote it from scratch. Uh, so this is a stock ticker. And the, way, the reason why I find it interesting is because you have many different types of, uh, of concepts that you can demo. So this is actually like, there's no database, it's actually live, it's like live streaming data. Um, uh, it has, so you have to solve like the domain problem, you have to have queries that are live updating on the right, a whole bunch of rendering, things that are interesting in a nice small package. So we're going to uh, use this as our demo app today. Uh, so at first I wanna just kind of take a look at this thing as, from a holistic perspective. Uh, this is the real app running. Let's see if we can boost this up. Oh, that's not what I wanted. All right, so just to show that it is a real thing, this is the app running locally. And you just see it sort of behaves as expected. We've got a whole bunch of stock transactions coming in. We have opening prices, uh, which is just like the, you know, the, the price that each stock started at. And as you see, uh, as we get more and more data and we're able to crunch some of these more advanced calculations, that uh, will sort of flesh out uh, on the right. And so I'll just stop this for now. And so what I want to do, th so the source code of that is, is completely available because I want people to be able to like poke at it and kind of look at what it looks like. But I want to talk about this entire UI container. Uh, and mainly because I just want to get this out of the way. <laughs> uh, functional UIs. Um, there's a huge problem and it's that if anyone was here last year, I won't rant about this again, but the DOM is stateful and imperative, and that just flies in the face of all the functional techniques that you're going to try to use. It's going to undermine your functional quest. Um, the only way, like, unless you're just using like Lodash, is in like you, your functional paradigms are limited to your utility folder, uh, you're gonna want to solve this problem uh, in, by having a functional rendering layer. So for me, that's React. 
I'm known as the React guy a lot. I spoke about it a lot last year. But this talk is not about React. I promise I wouldn't be that guy today. So there are other, there are other options as well. Elm is like one that's huge right now uh, well, on, the, on the come up, I should say. And there's plenty of other implementations too. So if you want to use these other ones, be my guest. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about the surrounding functionality around it. Uh, but when I do have to render, uh, reference a render layer, I'm going to use React just because that's what I know and love. So, but this is, as long as your rendering layer uh, can implement this, I'm happy. So it should, your UI layer should be able to take in all of your app state and be able to render out the same UI as long as uh, it, the same state keeps coming in and there should be no surprises there. That's, that is what we'll call functional UI. And we're getting there, right? So like this is the new version of React that just landed. I'm pretty fired up about this. I mean, this is, ex this is everything we want with no boilerplate. This is a real component where uh, each row in that table is a transaction which just takes in the transaction model and you just return the representation of what you want the UI to look like. So that's, this is why I like React so much. But that's it, no more React. Um, I, what I want to do is dive into the other parts of the app. Uh, I want to talk about this first, mainly just because this is the bulk of the app. Uh, this is where all of our app data lives. And I also think that this is where, this is where I tripped up at first. And so I'm hoping to kind of throw some a, a minor cautionary tale in there and also just uh, kind of point at functional domain logic and how to set that up in sort of a reliable way. Um, so this is the data. This is all the data in your app. And we'll uh, first talk about collections and models and we'll talk about them in those terms because that's the easiest way to, to understand. I think it's fair to say that everyone understands collections of models when I say that. Um, so when you think about that table, that is just, that's, that is the collection of each row being a model. Uh, with only one caveat in that it's, all of the data has to be immutable. And uh, you'll hear that throughout the presentation and we'll find out why this is important later. I use immutable.js. Um, I happen to love it and use it every day. Uh, but you don't have to. There are other ones too. And you can also just not mutate plain JavaScript objects if you want. I just think that takes more discipline and uh, you're, you could, it could be more frustrating to you at the beginning. So if you're just starting off, I think that this is a more friendly way to go. So from the collection perspective, um, what this gives you is it gives you like real data structures, which is pretty cool. List, stack, map, ordered map, set, ordered set. A whole bunch of ways of organizing your data that, map, that match your business model. Uh, and it's easy. Uh, they behave just like you'd expect. Um, What's more interesting to me are models, uh, mainly just because uh, this is usually where we build a, our applications around models. But first, uh, a little side note. This is a term, I wish I could remember the origin of it, but this term, primitive obsession, has been in my vocabulary for a while from the old object-oriented literature I used to read. And it's, um, I couldn't remember the quote, so I just paraphrased. Um, but it's the idea that your app or your domain model, no matter how complex, can be described by solely primitive values at the language level. So this is things like, okay, I have a transaction. Well, what, it should just be a plain JavaScript object. Like, why would I bother? Like, I could just, it's a key value. Um, and it, a list of it is just arrays. Um, and that's fine at the beginning, but like, as we, we're going to want to add behavior and different things to that. And if you don't have a home for it, it's going to end up bleeding out through all different parts of your app. And this is where the dry principles come from, to so kind of uh, reel that in. And I'm also going to say that this applies to the library level as well. So we have maps, lists, sets, stacks, et cetera, in Immutable. But I don't want you to just think like, okay, that's cool, so I'm just going to do everything that way. You will fall into the same exact trap. And this is exactly what I did. Uh, and it's also a, a second trap because what I did was I fell prey to one of uh, these. Uh, this is a, a post written by David Nolan, who is the creator of Ohm and he's pretty active in the ClojureScript community. And when I was first getting into functional JavaScript, I read this, and I was like really inspired by it. And so I'll just read it so you can hopefully see where I got lost. Um, so he talks about tangible data in Ohm. He says, object-oriented programming as a paradigm has many real benefits, but one of the worst plagues it has inflicted on programming is obscuring data. Functional programming is not a silver bullet, but its emphasis on unadorned data is a guiding light. No models. And so that no models part is, I was just like, yeah, he's right. You know, like we have map and that's like, it's similar to a JavaScript object. And like I can model my entire domain using that key values and then a list is the same thing as array. Like, yeah, this is good. Um, and maybe, I, I'm sure I'm missing something here, but I, I think it's a trap if you're going from object oriented, an object oriented style and you go directly into that. Because uh, you will end up with your business model, your business logic living in a bunch of different places and you'll just start to be like, okay, wait, I need to reel, I need to like reel something in here. I need a home for all of this functionality. And that's where immutable records come in. 
Um, and they are just like other models, except you can't change them, which is kind of funny because people think of models as being the home of your business logic with some helper methods, and that's where you change them. You, you call methods, you update the values on it. Um, so this will seem strange at first, but when you actually look at the code that it takes to create an immutable record, it's actually, uh, the weirdest thing about this for you will probably be the ES6 syntax, not the actual record. Um, but you just, essentially you give it some default values, and then you just can provide some helper methods over it. If you want to find out if it's a loss, like you can put your business logic here. And I get that you could put this in a folder with functions somewhere else, but I promise that coming from another um, framework or something like that, this will feel more at home to you. You'll know where to put things, and things will be less strewn about, and you'll be less stressed out um, just by having an answer for where things go. And so what are the benefits of using immutable records instead of just, um, instead of just like a regular model? Like why can't I just use backbone models? Well first, you can trust them, and this matters more in a, like a concurrent paradigm where you just like hand off your models and like, if anything changes that, you're screwed, like you can't, uh, you can't trust it. In JavaScript, you just get the minor benefit of like you can pass this object around your entire application and not worry, if anything tries to mutate it, it can't. And you can count on knowing, the, you can accurately find the source of bugs because uh, understanding that nothing in your core domain can modify these objects, and that really helps you narrow things down. But I think the more important but weirder concept at first will be that your app can trust immutable objects. Does that sound weird, like, that your app can trust them? It did to me when I wrote it, so. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at a different part of the UI and talk about where that comes into play. So as opposed to our core data, which is our models and collections, we've got these alternate views, right, the opening price. Uh, the RSI calculator, and you'll see the average loss calculator. Um, these are sort of queries on our core data, right? They're functions that you would, you would pass your core data to, and you sort of like, and, and you can like process it and transform it. Um, and so I want to talk about how we do that sort of thing in the, in the functional world, since our models are immutable, and we, need to and we can't change them, so we have to have some, hand them off to something else to do this. Well, this is pretty easy. So if the last part was the data, this is the functions uh, part of our domain. Um, we'll call these services and queries. Uh, just to give them a name, but you already know what they are. Uh, a service is just a stateless function that accepts and transforms immutable data to fulfill a business operation. So if you used to have an order model and a, a method on it that says uh, place or finalize or something, you, you can't do that on an immutable model because you can't change it. So you just pluck that thing right off and you have a function called uh, finalize order or create order and you pass your model into it. It will transform it and return a new version of that model uh, that, is, that is now updated and finalized. Uh, that is what we'll call services. Queries are a little bit different. They start off sounding the same. They're stateless functions that accept immutable data and they transform, calculate, reduce, or repurpose data, um, much like that sidebar. Um, we're just taking a different view on it. And there's a pretty, the big difference here is like, we want to really uh, actively cache queries, whereas like a, a, um, a service, you don't really want to. You still kind of want to let the service handle what it's going to do in business logic. But a query, when you're dealing with immutable data and pure functions, if you receive the same object, you know that the same, it's going to be the same end result, no matter what. That is a guarantee that we get. And so we want to be able to short circuit that for performance. So just to be thorough, I want to show you what one of these looks like. This is actually the function that calculates the initial stock prices. There's nothing interesting really here. It just maps over the, the stock objects and it transforms it to an object that looks like this and we just pass this down to the, the UI layer and it just knows how to render it. There's really nothing interesting. Uh, the more interesting one is the RSI calculation. Um, and at first, when I created this screenshot, I, I don't know, I just like, it, from a distance it looks just such like spaghetti code and it just feels like you're gonna be going backwards. And, um, but I promise you, I assure you that it's not. This is actually a module that has about four pure functions in it that easily could have been broken out um, that are just pipelined together. And so I want you to think about, if you want to think about who here is kind of like new to immutable data? It's actually, wow. So there's more people than I thought that are kind of sold on it. Um, but if you want to kind of understand how this works, imagine that you worked at this company that created this app, and before this app was created, you, it was your job to manually do this, right? So at the beginning, at the, at the beginning of the week, you're handed this folder that's full of data, and it's like, here's a list of five stocks, and I need to find out what the RSI is on, on this. Uh, by the end of the week. How would you do, go about doing that? You would say, all right, so let's figure out what stocks are there. So we'll first we'll pull out which stocks that I need to figure this out for. And then let's figure out the average loss and gain for the last two weeks because that's what's needed. Um, and then let's, and then from that we can deduce the RSI. And that's, and that's pretty easy. So you write up your report. 
you leave it on your desk for your boss, you come in on Monday, and your job depends on the presentation and this being accurate. And then you come in and your boss says, ah, oh, I love it, the report looks great. I modified some of the numbers in there, um, but the end result, like, it still looks fine. I think you should present it as is. How many people feel comfortable going in that meeting and presenting their findings? Well, you'd have to do it all over again. Like, there's no way you can know what changed. You're just like, ah, god damn it. <laughs> uh, so there's no shortcut here. You have to recalculate everything because you don't know what has changed. But imagine that instead of that folder, you, you were smart and you brought a briefcase to work and you locked that thing before you left. Uh, your boss, he might have some ideas about how it could be different, but you, your calculations are sound. It's impossible for the, end, for the result of this calculation to have changed because no one could have changed the source. And so in functional programming, we talk about memoization and caching, and that's all that it's about. If GetStocks is like, hey, this is the same thing I received last time, it returns the cache version, then this returns the cache version, then that returns the cache version. It needs to do no more extra work until the thing has actually changed that it receives. Um, and so that, this is a big reason why uh, immutable data is important. And when the core of your entire app becomes immutable data, you get all of these queries get to benefit from this sort of caching automatically. Like you just don't have to worry about it uh, because you're not you're only mutating when you have to, uh, and and these functions can tell when it's mutated and when it needs to do actual work. Uh, so you don't have to write any caching logic. It just it works that way. And so for the last part of the UI, we've talked a lot about immutable data and, and different things like that, but. How many people have written a program that never mutates anything? Or like anything interesting anyway, other than a calculator? Like there's no, a real world apps have to mutate things. And so I wanna talk about this sort of interactive part, right? So we wanna start, we can reset, con configure, like this is gonna change the state of our app. Uh, so we wanna examine sort of how it impacts that core domain. Like how do we get changes into an immutable ecosystem like this? Um, so, when we've been talking about no change, no change, no change, immutable, 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 pure functions, now we're gonna talk about change. Where, does, where in our app do we put these mutations and changes? So this part, so we've covered the data and the functions, now let's talk about the actions and how we change the outside world, outside of this. Um, well, this is where I think we, need, we, we really should, re like, we should rely on libraries to be able to help us in this regard, just because it, it has been such a good idea for me. Uh, I use Redux, like I've used Flux, um, for the last year or so, uh, pretty, pretty much every day. Redux is sort of a, a slight take on it with some pretty good improvements. Um, and so I will just, I love this title. Redux is a predictable state container for JavaScript apps. That, that just sums up exactly what I'm looking for. Um, it helps you write applications that behave consistently uh, and are easy to test. On top of that, it provides a great developer experience with live code editing combined with time traveling debugging. That sounds, that sounds kind of crazy. Um, you can use Redux with React or with any other view library. This, there are actually adapters for Angular or like whatever you, you want to use. Uh, and this is my favorite part is like, we all, it's like, oh, he's pitching another framework. But I'm not, this thing is 2K. 2K, so for, by comparison, we all think of Backbone being like the, the smallest of the UI libraries. Backbone is four times bigger than this. Uh, so this is not a framework, this is not anything. This is just like a pattern that you can use to put over your core immutable app that you're creating, that is your business logic, that will let you um, trigger actions that update state in the outside world and can participate in this, uh, in this flow. So I wanted to create my own diagram, but this guy, Andre Stoltz, he did such a good job that I figured I'd talk about his, and this is just how it works. I said, this is React for me, it could be whatever you want, but uh, when the user clicks a mouse, it just fires off actions into this store, which just has a, a bunch of, like, and immediately I can probably feel like your eyes are glazing over. But this is where you put your services and things like that. So if you want, if you, uh, you would trigger an action and say like, I've got this order and it needs to be finalized and that's it and you just pass it into that store. Your services live in that store and it's like, hey, I know how to do this thing. And so it will accept your order object, it will modify it into the next version which is the finalized order version and it will stick that in the store in place of the old one. This is how data is changed uh, in, in this sort of unidirectional functional flow system. So it is completely inspired by Flux but I'd argue it's more inspired by Elm, which I don't know if anyone is, is familiar with that, but it has way more to do with Elm and CQRS, which is Command Query Responsibility Segregation, than it does with Flux at all. It just uses the same terms as Flux. And so uh, there, was, there was one mention of time travel debugging and stuff in there, and uh, that, that can be like a pretty funky concept. Uh, has anyone seen time travel debugging before? So most people haven't, okay, cool. Um, what I want to do is simulate, like th these are all nice terms, and 
I, my goal here is to not get people to buy into uh, like the buzz or the hype behind something. What I want to talk about is like making our jobs easier. And so I want to actually simulate fixing a bug in this app. I left a bug in here on purpose, like I always do. Um, <laughs> so that we can go in and fix it and we can see what the difference is, if there's any difference between like your existing workflow. So, if you notice, when I ran this app previous to this, uh, this probably slid right by you, but like everything looks fine here, we've got our opening prices, and then we've got Google's RSI is negative infinity. Uh, and I don't, like, I don't know what that is. Uh, and by the way, I don't even know what RSI, RSI was before I did this. I just needed, I Googled an interesting financial calculation that I could use to just demo this app. Um, but negative infinity, you're gonna get a bug report for that, like that's not right. Even, even if it is right, you, we can't be displaying it like that, right? So what, what's the first step you do? What, if this was your app, where would you start? Someone, someone said something, say it louder. Debuggers. Yep, putting in debuggers. Um, and also probably putting in some like, console.logs to, like, to just look at the state of your app. Um, well, one of the cool things about using uh, leading on a framework, or like a 2K library, I should say, is that uh, we get some of these things that are, that are built in. And so this it has nothing to do with my app. Uh, this, the only thing this does is it says, since you're using immutable data, I can rely, I can count on you not changing it. And every time you emit an action, an action is a, is a, a thing that we can point to. It is like a, a little JSON object that says, here's the type of thing I want to change and here's the payload you need to change it. Almost like you would save off in um, like a, Distributed system if you want to like run a task on like a task queue. You would like give it enough information that it knows how to perform that job later. So every action, instead of it being like a function call, like, like uh, events like we're used to, it sends that off. It goes through that unidirectional pipeline, changes the, the data, and anything that it changes, um, since immutable, immutable data cannot be changed, it just leaves that one behind and moves forward with the new version, right? So every action that goes through leaves a snapshot of state at that exact moment when the action went through the system. And since we're saying we, can, we're, we won't change anything, I promise, uh, Redux can actually keep track of all the stuff for us and provide us with some development tools, which are pretty cool. So um, let's see. Beta. All right. Probably see it a little bit better now. All right, so negative infinity. How, how do we get here? So if we want to play with some of these dev tools, um, we can essentially undo actions that happen as part of the, uh, our app. So if we toggle off this tick or stop, that's when I click the stop button. And you see the UI just reacts uh, because the only thing that we changed was when you click stop, it just sets like a Boolean flag. And so we changed the state of that button in the bottom right. And that's all that happened. All right, but our bug is still there. It still says negative infinity. So let's start plucking transactions off of our list here. So we're, we are doing time travel debugging uh, by essentially just moving back to the snapshot of state at that exact moment. And if we have one giant blob of mutable state, we cannot do this because it's still, still the same blob. We, and we don't know what changed from one step to the next. And so we can essentially, so we've still got this bug, and we can just keep walking through until we, oh, okay, so we plucked off that last action, and now we're back to a real value. Okay, so now we know where to start. We haven't even thrown a debugger or anything like that yet. We know that something happened here with this particular transaction that caused our UI to get wonky. And then so what we can do from here is we can actually like open up this action, and we can inspect, like, okay, this is what happened. This is all the metadata that came in. Um, but you know, we don't see anything strange, but if you'll notice like when, you, when I'm toggling this, you'll also notice that average loss for Google is going from 50, around $50 to zero. That's the only other thing. So we don't know, is it related? Okay, all right, let's figure, let's figure this out. So we wanna actually dive into what just happened there. All right, so then what we would do is we would come into our RSI calculation and uh, we can actually take a look. And we're like, okay, well, so what happened here? To calculate the RSI, like, we need to do a bunch of different things, blah, blah, blah. But it all relies on this one thing where average gain divided by average loss. And so it seems like something happened where when average loss changes to zero, this becomes a problem. Does anyone know what happened here? Divide by zero, right? So it's like, okay, I think, so I wonder if, I was smart enough to leave the real working version of the code commented out right below the bug. <laughs> I wonder if that is the case. So if we uncomment that and save and come back, 
um, we, we now see Google is 100. Okay, so, so by definition, that is the, the def that is the correct thing to do. If you cannot calculate if it's divided by zero, the value is 100. That is our business domain says so, right? And now we can actually keep rewinding back and just make sure like this thing, it didn't break anything else. We can go back in time, forward in time, and just uh, essentially you know, figure out what's going on. Uh, and if, if you've ever worked with like a live reloading system or something like that, you've seen something like this before. But there's one big difference though, and it's that like this app doesn't persist any state. So if this live reloads, it's gonna blow away everything. This is a live feed. You can't pause the real world. And so uh, how, can, how can we get this sort of like this behavior um, without any sort of live reloading? And that's what we'll talk about. We'll talk about next. Um, I want to talk about uh, the mental model of static versus dynamic, and also how we got into that world where we could uh, do that time travel debugging. And I'll give you a hint, it all has to do with uh, the way we, we look at actions as they go through our system. But first, um, I want to talk about static and dynamic. Uh, have, do you remember the first console program that you wrote that might have just like been, it calculated two numbers and spit something out? How complex was that? Did you worry that if you ran it in like at a different time that it would like it would be weird and like not output the right thing or like maybe it would hang? That didn't happen because it's a static program. It's pretty easy. It does one run through. It does its job. It prints stuff out and, and it's done. It's over. A dynamic process, something that runs over time, like a daemon. How many people have, have had a problem with a daemon before? Something like, is it dead? It just goes rogue. It won't respond to anything. Like this is so much different from that simple console program that you wrote. And that is the difference between static and dynamic. Um, as far as uh, as far as we're going to talk about it today, and so Redux, if you read it, when we read the docs, it used words like predictable and behaves consistently, which are big words that don't mean anything really until you actually like back them up. So so how does it make things more predictable uh, and behave more consistently? And we'll go back to that requirement that I had at the very beginning, which is we need functional UIs, and this is why we need functional UIs. If you remember, it takes the entire app state in and it spits out the same UI. This should be deterministic. We should be able to rely on this as a function. Um, and in most systems, that can kind of be the case, right? And so if, if we're in like backbone world or, or whatever, you, you have it, like if you refresh the page, it's always good, no matter what the state was, right? Um, and so that function of state equals the UI is first, is true the first time you run it. But the difference is that this happens in between the first run and your bug. And I showed this, that same rat's nest of actions and uh, events last year. It's because they're fire and forget. We just trigger them off. They're functions that get executed, and you're just like, if something broke, you, you have to do a debugger or do a console.log. And if you're in the middle of 10 actions deep, like we were in that stock ticker, if, that, if we made a change and it reloaded, we just lost every, all of our uh, detective work to get to that state in the app is gone. It's blown away because these things are not persisted. These are just ephemeral, just events that happen once and you can't really trace them. If you contrast that with the system that we just looked at, which it actually, every action that goes through the system is a thing that you can point to and hold. It is an object that goes through that system. And you can store it with the data at the time that it went through. Um, then this doesn't become so much of an issue anymore. This is part of your app state, right? And so if these are persistable and we can point to them, we can look at them, we can replay them, rewind, fast forward, uh, then this really becomes true with a function of state plus all of the actions that are happened that have happened since you reloaded equals your UI. And we can count on that and rely on that. And that is how we can get these sort of uh, amazing debugging tools and be able to like really rationalize about our UI at any point in time and not I remember how it was and these 11 things happened and I think I still remember how it should render but there's a bug and I don't know how to reproduce it. And so I, I was debating, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time and I think I still don't even fully understand it. Uh, but I think there's so much in here and I debated not talking about it today but it has to do with that static versus dynamic difference when we're writing programs. So it's long so I wanna break it up into parts but it's by Dijkstra, and, and I'll read the whole thing at first, and it'll likely be confusing, but it says, our intellectual powers are rather geared to master static relations, and our powers to visualize processes evolving in time are relatively poorly developed. For that reason, we should do, as wise programmers aware of our limitations, our utmost to shorten the conceptual gap between the static program and the dynamic process, to make the correspondence between the program spread out in text space and the process spread out in time as trivial as possible. 
And so think about that static as being that console app, simple, dynamic process, that daemon that is very hard to predict over time. He's talking about shortening that gap and trying to make it so with pure functions, if you look at an add function, you can see the input and you already know the output. Um, with long running processes with mutable state, you cannot do that. And he's talking about shortening that gap. So if we take a look at this one at a time, first of all, I just want to applaud him for even saying this because it's something that we don't say enough, but like we're not super, like no one's superhuman, like we all have limitations and this is about our programs getting too big for us to hold in our head and not being able to like rationalize what's going on anymore. That is, that's what he's going for here. Um, so our intellectual powers, the way our brains are wired are geared to static relations, that predictable, given this one thing, this other thing should happen. Not most of the time it happens, but like yeah, every once in a while it's a totally weird, different thing and it's a strange outcome. Um, so our brains are wired that way. To visualize processes involving in time, they're poorly developed. We're just not good at it as a, as a species, it's not you. And so for that reason, we should do our utmost to shorten the conceptual gap between the static program, meaning we take everything into account when rendering out that UI. All of the actions, all of the state, everything comes into play. That is a static, a static relationship. We, we understand everything going in so we can predict what's coming out. Versus uh, the dynamic process where everything's fine at the beginning and then a whole bunch of mutation and, and things happen in the middle that we can't measure or see and we're supposed to predict the outcome. And so I hope that you come back to this quote and maybe glean some more insight from it, but this is how, this is why I liked it so much when I read it and when I, I didn't, hadn't even heard of Redux yet. And so when I sort of saw these functional principles, I was like, this is, I, I think this is what this guy's talking about. And so uh, with that, I just wanna say um, thank you. I'm, I'm Ben, I'll be hanging around afterwards if you wanna talk about some of this stuff. Uh, the source code for the app is available online, and slides are online uh, if you wanna talk about any of this stuff. And I think we're gonna do questions too. All right, yes, All right. do some questions. I don't know how this works. I think he's back there. Do we have a question back there? Yeah, okay. I'm back here. Hey, Ben, great talk. Um, so I just started using Redux recently. Huge fan, awesome, everyone should use it. Uh, but one of the biggest like hurdles I've had is uh, with like, the Rails community, it's very easy to know like how to do things the Rails way, I guess, if you will. And I'm just kind of struggling to figure out like how to do things the Redux way often. Uh, I was just wondering if you like had any good resources or like specific people I should be following in order to be doing things more the Redux way, I guess. Sure. Um, I think my favorite thing, like I mentioned before, is that Redux is only 2K. And so it's really so much conceptual rather than having to like, uh, having this like huge plug-in ecosystem. Uh, I'm sure you already follow Dan Abramov. For people who don't know who Dan Abramov is, I'm convinced, he, I'm convinced he's not an actual person uh, because he does way too much work. I just don't get it. Uh, and I'll show you his Twitter. I'm guessing that that's it. Nope, that's definitely not him. Anyway, his name's Dan Abramov. He, he created uh, Redux and is just a huge, uh, like a pillar of the React community. If you follow him on Twitter, you're gonna get most of the updates. Um, then if you, uh, I'm trying to think who else. Honestly, that's how I get most of my Redux information. And there's also a guy named ACD Light. Which, so uh, there's a Flux library called um, Fluxor, no, there's so many of them. Fluxor, yeah, okay. So he, he wrote that library, and he, as soon as he saw Redux, he's like, I give up, I'm not doing this anymore. Someone else take this over, his is way better. And so he actually has contributed like a ton of modules. The good thing is they're all on GitHub as a Redux dash something. Um, and so there's like one called like Redux RX. So if you don't like React, or you wanna do this in a different way, you can integrate it with like an RX system, or there's just like a whole bunch of like middleware, but I would follow those two guys, and I, I swear from there, you, they'll, you'll, it's like, it's like a graph, like that's the entry point, you'll figure it out from there. We had a question up here, I don't know, a couple. Um, as, as someone who's like, I think there's a microphone, but. Um, as someone who's relatively new to JavaScript, um, trying to grasp these uh, functional programming uh, concepts is kind of tough at first just because you know, I read different resources, I don't know which one to apply or which one to use. What are some starting points that you could give you know, some fundamental concepts to grasp strongly first? Great question. Um, 
as you can see, this is about half the list because I went off the end of the slide. I have, I, I did like a list of things uh, that I, I referenced or talked about during this talk, but there's a whole other list which would be here's, here's how to start. And I promise you, and I'm saying this in public so I have to do it, I will absolutely send one out on Twitter if you want to follow me. I, maybe that's the easiest way. And I'll say like, Functional JavaScript, the book by O'Reilly is, is the first one because it's foundational. Um, and then from there, like you can work your way up. Uh, but I, I'd actually, I made the argument uh, that it's easier for you, you because you can come into it this way instead of like having to unlearn habits. Again, I'm, but that's, that's just me because that's my perspective. I, I don't really know. I, I'm not sure it's a little overwhelming, but uh, I promise you I, I'll send that out. Cool, thanks. There was another question. No problem. We've got some microphone confusion. Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk, Ben. Um, I noticed you were using ES6 classes uh, despite classical inheritance and classes kind of being at odds with uh, functional programming, at least conceptually. Yep. Um, how do you see the future of ES6 uh, classes and them kind of playing nicely together? Okay, so I used ES6 classes for two examples. One, to demonstrate the inheritance polymorphism thing at the beginning. I don't usually write apps that way. Um, let me find it here. So this is, an, this is a great question, I wanna address it. Uh, I talked about it in models. So here, this is the only example that I where I actually use ES6 classes. I do not use ES6 classes for React components, not, of, not for any fundamental reason, I just don't, I don't think it gives me anything additional. Um, for this, for models, I like it. And I like it here because, number one, they're immutable anyway. So I can't shoot myself in the foot in a lot of the ways that I can with traditional classes. So uh, that has my back. So I feel comfortable doing it in this way because uh, if I showed you how you instantiate these and you work with them, it is, it's super clean and, and very uh, easy to use uh, when, you, when you structure things this way. Um, and so like I said, I'm not a purist and I think that like, I don't usually use ES6 classes but I'm not opposed to them. Um, but for, for, for immutable state and for, like, for your domain stuff, if you do this way, like, you, can't, you won't shoot yourself in the foot just because immutable has your back. So in terms of what the future is for them, I, I have no idea. I, I think they're fine as long as you don't abuse them. But I, I just don't see the huge benefits, so I don't like seek them out all the time. But in the back, we had one more. Yeah, so it's working. Okay, great. Um, the way you demonstrate Redux looks really cool and powerful, but I was wondering if there are ever cases where an app state is too prohibitively large and storing it becomes a large waste of memory or something? Yep, sure, so the, the question can be addressed in, in two parts really. Um, one is, is the, uh, what is the memory pressure I guess on, on this? Like if you are, if every change that you make creates a whole new copy of your app state, is that the primary question? Okay, that's actually an immutable question and then uh, the Redux part is it keeps track of your entire history so that you can do replay and rewind. So I'll, I'll address those two separately. Uh, number one, <clears throat> in production, those dev tools are completely uh, compiled out. They're, they're non-existent, they're no op. So like there's no performance penalty of like shipping that to production uh, because they're just not there once you get past development mode. Um, and you can actually just turn them off in development mode if you find that it's a little sluggish, but I mean, they're pretty damn useful. Um, and then in terms of Memory for, uh, this is another important one. So immutable, it doesn't actually do a full copy of the object. Um, these are called persistent data structures. So if you were to do like a clone, you could do the same thing. But in an immutable data structure, uh, and now this is gonna, this could be a whole talk on this and it usually is, but um, it will follow the path that you change and only make copies of the, few nodes that you actually changed and everything else is just copied over by reference. So there's no real shared anything. And then once those old ones are not re referenced anymore, they're just garbage collected uh, just as usual. So there's like a little bit more memory, but this is how, this is actually how Clojure does data structures. Like this is where, it, is what it was inspired from. Um, there's a lot of like academic, this is not a new idea, it's just new to JavaScript. Um, and so when it comes to that, I have to defer to the really smart guys who work on Immutable. Uh, but in Redux, the answer is it gets factored out for run, for production. So um, as you were just f closing out your answer, you mentioned this is not a new idea. Right. Um, functional programming has been around since the 60s, early 60s. Dijkstra's quote was 1968, if I, my eyes are 
working well? That is correct. Um, but functional programming got a lot, didn't get a lot of attention in the industry or in academics until recently. So what's changed, you know, in the recent, you know, what, what kind of um, precipitated this newer, I don't, I'm tempted to say fad, but I, I, that's also a little bit dismissive, but this new wide interest in functional programming over the past 10 plus or minus years. Yep, exactly right. Um, so I covered it quickly because I, I didn't want to waste people's time in case they weren't, they didn't see the value in it. But uh, this is mainly what I was talking about, Moore's Law. Um, just because we don't have, it, it's not as much pressure as it is in JavaScript, uh, but in every other programming language, uh, the, you know, parallel computing is, is like the only way forward is the argument uh, because of Moore's Law. Otherwise, we won't be able to take advantage of the processors, uh, the processor power that we get. And so that's why every other language is sort of pushing that, and it is just becoming... Um, you can say it's a fad, uh, but it's also it, it's also a very valid way to write programs. And, and um, that's why I, where is it? One more thing. I talked about familiarity, right? And so if if functional is the future of programming in general, uh, sometimes it makes sense to share those across languages. Uh, and if you can do so and not pay a penalty or much of a penalty at all, which I think is the case in JavaScript, like I wouldn't be. I write my apps this way, and I'm not a masochist. Like I wouldn't want to submit myself to something if it was that much more painful. So if you can do the same exact sort of paradigms that you do in, in other ways, and it makes sense, like this is the way you are starting to think about programming now, then I think that that's a win. And so that's why the old is new again. And the one other cool thing I didn't mention that I wanted to demo, but ran out of time, is that when we saw that list of actions going down the right-hand side where we can like replay and rewind, you can actually serialize out. And, because, uh, and, and you can actually take it and email it to somebody in a developer, so if you're a QA person, you can serialize out all of the app state, so the starting state in all of the actions, and you can email to somebody and they can load it into theirs and get into the same app state. So how we were sort of time travel debugging without reloading, you can actually send that to someone. So you can do some pretty cool things when, when you follow this sort of, uh, this guideline, these, these guardrails, I should say. Right, in the interest of time, one more question, if there, if there are any more. No, looks like that's it. All right, great. Thank you, Ben. Thank you.